Hello students, I Sasi Bhushan Tiwari, welcome you all. In today's session, we will be solving few questions that appeared in second physics paper of this year, JE at 1. Actually, I will show you the entire question paper, but I will solve only select few questions. You have understood it wrong. I am not going to solve the tough one. Rather, I am going to solve few of the easiest questions which were there in the advanced paper too. I want to show you how you could have a score very good despite leaving all the tough questions. Yes, JE advanced, the exam JE advanced is typically a low scoring exam and a student can manage to get good rank even if he or she solves limited number of questions and that too easier one. So, assuming that you were allotted one hour time for the physics segment of this paper, uh, number of questions, 18 number of questions might prove to be a daunting task for most of you. But the easiest 8 to 10 questions, uh, those that would have fetched you uh, a good mark will not take more than 40 to 50 minutes for any well prepared student. So, what I am going to show you in this session is how you could have picked up the easier questions and solved them without taking much pressure inside the exam hall. So, let us begin. Huh. Yes, I am going to show you the entire paper, but I will just go on deliberately skipping the tougher ones. In another video, I will solve the remaining question, the so called tough question, right. So, let us start. This is the first question in J Physics 2022 second paper. I will read the question. A particle of mass 1 kg is subjected to a force which depends on position. The force varies with position according to this equation. The force changes with x coordinate as well as y coordinate of the particle. And k is a constant the value of which is 1 in proper unit. The unit is kg per second square. Okay. So, the value of k is 1. But this is how a well written question in physics appears. Uh, what one could have done is one could have written force is equal to minus x i cap minus y j cap, right. But that equation will appear to be dimensionally incorrect because how can we equate force to displacement or position? No. So, there, there is a constant over here. One is a constant, but it is not a dimensional response. It has got some time. So, this is a well written question, right. So, k is a constant value of which is 1 kg per second square. At time t is equal to 0, the particle's position is given. The initial position of the particle is given. It is 1 by root 2 i cap plus root 2 j cap meter. The position is in meter. And the initial velocity of the particle is also given. It is minus root 2 i cap plus root 2 j cap plus 2 by pi k cap meter per second. Vx and Vy are velocity components x and y component of the particle at some later time t, right. The question says ignore gravity, there is no gravity. That means the question is basically telling you that there is one and only one force acting on this particle and this is the force. Uh, at the time when z coordinate of, coordinate of the particle becomes 0 0.5, find the value of this number. x coordinate of the particle into y component of velocity dy minus y coordinate of the particle into x component of velocity. Now, looking at this question as a student, uh, the first thing that may come to my mind, if I am a well prepared student, the first thing that may come to my mind is that this force is a, is a conservative force. This kind of force uh, whose x component depends on x and y component depends on y only, it is a conservative force. For such a force, energy is conserved. So, when the particle is moving, some of its kinetic plus potential energy is conserved. 
so i may be tempted to apply energy conservation but before i move ahead i must look at what i am supposed to find x coordinate of the particle into y coordinate of velocity minus y coordinate into x component of velocity now think think a little bit or if possible write the conservation energy conservation equation you you will apparently see that this kind of term is very difficult to obtain isn't it then some of you some of you who are really sharp you may notice that the x component of force is proportional to minus x so this tells you this gives you a hint that uh, there is some sort of shm kind of equation that is uh, we are going to obtain and then y component of force is also uh, proportional to y so again if you write newton second law f is equal to ma in y, di y, y direction again you will get a shm kind of equation but those equation needs to be solved using the initial conditions you have to find the constant a sin omega t plus delta and the solution is going to be very long yes that is one way how we can solve this question but the point right i am making here is uh, this kind of term is not very apparent to us those who are really intelligent very intelligent they will immediately understand okay this kind of term can be obtained in cross product of in cross product of position vector and velocity so from there they may get a hint that this equation might have something to do with angular but okay can you see my line of thinking um, i am not very sure about how to solve this question so what i will do is thinking of all these things what i am going to do inside the exam or i am going to leave this question. so i'll leave this question this is a very difficult question inside the exam hall i'll leave it i'll simply move on to the next question the students in this session i am not solving all the questions i am telling you how you can identify easier one just by rejecting the difficult one and get selected in uh, one of the iit yes now look at this question isn't it very easy isn't it something that you have solved n number of times during your preparation yes it is in a radioactive decay chain reactor thorium 230 it decays in multiple steps and ultimately converts itself into lead 240 how many alpha and beta particles are emitted in the process what is the ratio of number of alpha particles to that of beta particles that are emitted during the entire process this is a very easy question and any well prepared student knows how to solve it uh, just for your benefit i'll show how it easy it is actually thorium 230 90 gets converted into polonium it's not lead i'm so sorry it's polonium 214 84 now all of us know that mass number changes only when there is an alpha decay in all other kinds of decay uh, mass number does not change so in this particular conversion mass number decreases by 16 from 230 it becomes 214 so if mass number decreases by 16 it means four alpha particles have been emitted surely during this conversion in multiple steps four alpha particles were emitted four alpha particles were emitted that is guaranteed why because the mass number has gone down by 16 in every alpha emission mass number decreases by 4 so total four number of alpha particles have been emitted now if four number of alpha particles have been emitted that 4 into 2 8 unit of positive charge has been thrown out of the nucleus so if 8 unit of positive charge has been thrown out of this nucleus then the number atomic number must fall to 82 as well 90 minus 8 is 82 but the question says that the final species that we are getting has an atomic number of 84 so we somehow need to increase this atomic number by 2 and all of you must be knowing 
that in emission of negative beta particle, uh, the atomic number of the daughter product that you obtain is higher than that of uh, the parent. So, if two beta particles are also emitted during uh, this multiple steps of this particular chain reactor, then by way of emission of two negative charge, the product, the final product that we are getting, uh, it will have uh, its atomic number increased by two. So, we will get a final atomic number of 84. So, obviously, four alpha particles and two beta particles were emitted. Now, it is very easy to see that the ratio of number of alpha and beta particles emitted will be two only. Isn't it very easy? It's very easy. It's very easy. And the point is, you get same mark for solving this question as well as this question. Why will I solve this question? Ah, I'll solve all these type of questions first, and then maybe if I have lot of time left with me, I'll go back to question number one. But in the first round of my attempt. I will never touch that question number one. There are more low hanging fruits out there and you should try to catch them. Right? Let us move on to the next question. Uh, I am having a little bit of difficulty uh, in actually telling whether this question should be classified as an easy question or a difficult question. It depends. It depends how well prepared a student is. Uh, just read the question. Two, this is based on Wheatstone bridge. Two resistances R1, which is X ohm, and R2, which is 1 ohm, are connected to a wire AB of uniform resistivity as shown in the figure. This is a wire made of uniform uh, material of uniform resistivity. And the radius of the wire varies linearly. The radius of the wire varies linearly. I will draw it like this. So that you can see it clearly. The question says that radius of the wire changes from A to some other value B and it increases linearly from this end to this end. So, as one moves from one end of the wire to the other end, the radius keeps on growing. It increases linearly with this distance x. So, as I said, many of you who prepared really well for JE advanced exam, uh, they must have solved this question. I mean, they must have calculated resistance of this kind of conductor, this kind of piece of conductor. So, when you are aware of how to find resistance of this kind of conductor, this question is pretty trivial, I would say. Uh, okay, so, this is the conductor and then there is a galvanometer connected to it. The question says that, when this jockey sliding point, the galvanometer end is placed at the midpoint of this wire, this wire has a length of 100 centimeter according to the question and the midpoint is at a distance of 50 centimeter from point. When you place, when you connect this galvanometer to the midpoint of the wire, the uh, galvanometer shows zero deflection. So, this is a balanced Wheatstone bridge R1 by R2 will have same ratio as resistance of this part divided by resistance of this part of the wire. So, if I just know how to calculate the resistance of this kind of wire, I will be able to solve this question, is not it? Uh, still, let me consider it as a difficult question. I will skip this question for right now. Right now, I will skip this question. Okay. In other video, I will tell you how to solve it, but I am assuming that it is a difficult question for many of these students. I will not touch it, because I do not know how to find this resistance. Leave it. Now, this is a question which may be a bit lengthy, but everybody, every sincere aspirant knows how to solve. Everybody knows how to solve. The only thing is, uh, you have to do with little bit of care, so that you do not commit any uh, arithmetical mistake. Otherwise, this is a very simple question based on dimensional analysis. The question is, in a particular system of unit, a physical quantity can be expressed in terms of electric charge E, mass of electron M E, Planck's constant H and Coulomb's constant K, which is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. 
right epsilon not is permittivity of vacuum in terms of these physical constants the dimension of magnetic field is given like this uh, the dimension of e is alpha dimension of mass of electron is beta dimension of planck's constant is gamma and dimension of uh, coulomb's constant is delta then what will be value of alpha plus beta plus gamma plus delta well this is a pretty straightforward question but you have to do it with uh, while being really attentive so that you don't commit any silly mistake in solving this particular question so what are the physical quantities involved let us write down the dimensional formula for all of them um, electric charge e do you know the dimensional formula of electric charge i guess all of you know that electric charge is not a fundamental quantity current is a fundamental quantity so if you represent current by a in our dimensional formula a for ampere then at current into time is charge actually a into t is the dimensional formula of charge mass is mass uh, nothing to do about it planck's constant you all know that planck's constant into frequency is energy therefore dimensional formula of planck's constant will be that of energy divided by uh, frequency right energy energy mlt minus 2 is force and if you multiply force by some sort of length it becomes work or energy so just making this l as l square and this becomes the dimensional formula of energy frequency obviously is per second so t minus 1 if you simplify this you get m1 l square t minus 1 so this is the dimensional formula of planck's constant right now coulomb's constant coulomb's constant uh, you need to remember that force between two charges is given by this expression uh, therefore the dimensional formula of k is same as dimensional formula of force into r square by q q so force as i told you just now mlt minus 2 force into r square r is nothing but length so l square divided by q1 q2 what is q at so a square t square so you get m l q t minus 4 a minus 2 right am i right i hope i have not committed any mistake i am advising you to be very attentive <laughs> you should uh, i should also be similarly very focused while solving this question okay now the next term is b what is b b is magnetic field do you remember the dimensional formula of magnetic how can you write it uh, well uh, there is one simple formula I, i guess everybody remembers force is equal to q v b when a charge q uh, moves with velocity v perpendicular to magnetic field b it experiences a force q v b using this we can write the dimensional formula of b b will be dimension of b will be dimension of force that is m l T minus two divided by dimension of charge that is at divided by dimension of velocity which is l t minus. To simplify this, l goes away, and what we are left with is m one. There is no l. T minus one. Uh, in fact, it is t minus two. In the denominator itself, the t cancels out. One and t minus. in the numerator t minus 2 remain right and then we have a minus so this is the dimensional formula of uh, magnetic field so we have written down the dimensional formula of all the quantities involved in this particular question now the question says that b can be written as 
e raised to the power alpha, m raised to the power beta, h raised to the power gamma, and k raised to the power delta, which means B says that e raised to the power alpha, m raised to the power beta, h raised to the power gamma, and uh, the last quantity is your uh, k. So k raised to the power delta. This is how it has been written. So we have to find actually alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and it can be done by uh, using the principle of dimensional homogeneity. The dimensions of B should match with dimensions of uh, the exact dimension of the term on the right hand side. So we can do this. Let us do this. Dimension of B is dimension of B is m t minus two a minus one. M t minus two a minus one. This is the dimension of B. Now E is nothing but charge A T raised to the power alpha. M is M beta. Then we have H. H is M L square T minus one. M L square T minus one raised to the power gamma. M L square T minus one. And then the last term is K, and that K is M L cube. T minus four, a minus so ml cube, ml cube, t minus four, and then a minus two. This raised to the power day. right? So on the left hand side, the dimension of mass is one, and on the right hand side, we have to see where the mass, uh, where the term of m is occurring at. Yeah, the power of m is beta. Then power of m is gamma. The total power of m becomes beta plus gamma, and then there is delta also. So beta plus delta, uh, beta plus gamma plus delta must be equal to one. On both sides, the dimension of mass must be same. Similarly, uh, let us compare the dimension of length. Here there is no length. So dimension of length in the dimensional formula of B is zero, and on the right hand side it is L raised to the power two gamma, L raised to the power three delta. So two gamma three delta must be equal to zero because there is no length on the other side. Then compare the dimensions of time. It is minus two over here, and it is alpha. Time raised to the power alpha, then it is minus gamma, and then it is minus four delta, and this must be equal to minus. Let us check once again. Time raised to the power alpha minus gamma minus four delta, and here it is minus. And then the fourth fundamental quantity uh, that is current. It is a dimension of minus one over here, and here it is alpha. Alpha, uh, then it is minus two delta, and this must be equal to minus one. So, students, you have got four linear equations in alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and there are precisely four unknowns. You can solve them with little bit of effort, and you can find uh, the values of alpha, beta, gamma, and Delta. Uh, I think all of you can do this on your own. Uh, if you do the solution, what you will get is you will get. Uh, I have a. Uh, I have the values written over here. So I just read them out. Alpha is three. Beta is two. Gamma is minus three. And delta is two. You can solve them. So just add them, alpha plus beta plus gamma plus delta, and you get your answer. So this is three plus two five minus three two two four. So our answer is four. So actually, uh, the questions those I have picked for these 
pattern are actually not difficult that is what i am trying to uh, tell you and these are questions which in fact many of you can solve and work out more efficiently even faster than me yes i am sure about it only thing is inside the exam hall you have to make a judgment which questions are to be attempted first okay so by this time i think we have spotted two very easy questions and please remember uh, whether a question is difficult or easy you are being awarded same mark for solving both of them so why not uh, solve the easier ones first now there is a question which i think inside the exam hall i may even get scared to read it's so long uh, i am not reading it if you wish you can read it uh, there are three different media uh, and a light ray is traveling through it so when the light ray passes through a uh, glass slab that is how you have read it when a light light ray passes through a glass slab it experiences some lateral shift isn't it and the outgoing ray the emergent ray remains parallel to the incident ray uh, but there is a lateral shift so when this light ray enters and changes medium every medium interface is parallel so the emerging light remains parallel to the incident light but it shifts so after passing through one set of three media it shifts by some amount x then after passing through same set of three media again it again shifts by x so if it passes through those sets n number of times the total shift is n into x and that is how this question can be solved it is not again a very difficult question but still for present session i would say it is difficult i will not do it okay uh, let us leave it let us leave it let us look for even easier question <laughs> let us look for even easier question though this question is also on easier side only uh, it is quite lengthy at first sight but it is easy but still i would say okay leave it leave it in first go uh, what do you think uh, i think there cannot be any other lower hanging fruit than this one i guess this is the easiest question among all the questions that we have discussed till now look at the question the question says there is a point charge and it is surrounded by an inverted cone an inverted cone and a hemisphere like this the top is a hemisphere the bottom is an inverted cone what is the electric flux through the conical surface the basic question is what is the electric flux through the conical surface well students everybody knows that uh, if there is a point charge and there is a closed surface around it whatever be the shape of the surface the total flux through the surface is q by epsilon isn't it and flux is a quantity that is basically a measure of a number of field lines piercing through a given surface if more number of field lines are piercing through a surface the flux is higher if the number of field lines piercing through a given surface is small we say that flux is small so uh, in this particular case just just for a minute uh, forget about the shape uh, the hemisphere and the cone forget about those shape just think about a point charge the point charge and its field lines the field lines are all radial no doubt about it if it is a point charge the field lines are all radial like this and if here i place a point charge and then i draw any kind of surface over it uh, this is a point charge and i have draw i have enclosed the upper half space i mean 2 pi square radian solid angle has been uh, covered by some sort of shape here it is hemisphere and the remaining 2 pi square radian has been covered by some any other shape of uh, surface here it is a perfect cone doesn't matter it is a common sense that half of the lines 
those are emanating from this point charge will pass through this hemispherical surface and the other half will pass through this conical surface isn't it so exactly through the entire surface closed surface the flux is this much and half of it half of it will be the flux half of it will be the flux through the hemispherical surface as well as the conical surface so through the conical surface the flux is just half of this in the question it says that the flux is n q by 6 epsilon naught what is value of n obviously n is 3 if you put n is equal to 3 you get this value so uh, nothing is here than this uh, if i if i am not wrong uh, this kind of questions might be appearing in board exams as well yes it is such an easy question in fact uh, i am hesitating to explain i don't know what to explain uh, any uh, any well prepared student knows how to answer such right so till now we have figured out three very easy questions and that too in a question paper which has been widely acclaimed to be very difficult all industry experts are saying that physics paper 2 was very difficult and that is what i want to challenge i think if a student is smart enough to pick easy question he can get selected with flying colors there is not exactly a need to solve the most difficult question appearing in the question paper uh, yes you can do that if you are aiming for rank 1 2 and 3 Yes, you can do that, but do it at a later stage, not in the first round while you are uh, just inside the exam hall. And uh, within first couple of hours, I think you should be looking for all your questions. Okay, let us look at the next question. Uh, this question is also an easy question. Uh, any average student, well prepared student, has solved a question like this. First, let me. Uh, tell you which question you all must have solved this kind of question you all must have solved this is what i believe uh, suppose there is a block it rests on a smooth surface and it is connected by a spring of force constant k1 Uh, forget this wall which is not there uh, this block has been placed on a smooth surface and it is connected to a spring of force constant k all of you know how to write this time period all of you know that this block will oscillate about its equilibrium position and the resulting time period of oscillation is 2 pi under root a upon k right all of you know this now when the block is performing oscillation let us say this is the mean position this is the equilibrium position reach starting from mean position reaching the extreme position the block takes t by 4 time i mean 1/4 of time period and then moving back from the extreme position to the mean position block again takes t by 4 second 1/4 of the time period so total time consumed in making this half oscillation is actually t by 4 right and then block again takes t by 4 second to move this way and then t by 4 second to move this way so the total time of one oscillation uh, has got four equal parts basically from here to here it takes t by 4 from here to here it takes t by 4 from here to here it takes t by 4 and from here to here it takes t by 4 so the overall time period becomes t for this part it is t by 2 for this part it is t by 2 now what does the question say the question says that assume that by by this time i guess all of you must have read the question the question says that on a frictionless horizontal plane a bob of mass 0.1 kg is attached to a spring okay this object is being called as bob bob of mass 0.1 kg is attached to a spring of natural length 0.1 meter 
the spring has on a stretch length of 0.1 meter the spring constant is 0 0.009 newton per meter when the length of the spring is greater than a lot what does it say the natural length of the spring when there is no stretch no compression the spring is completely relaxed its length is a lot okay agreed now when the length of the spring is greater than l when l is greater than a lot the sorry when l is greater than a lot the spring constant is k1 which means when the block is on right side of its equilibrium position when the block is somewhere here when the spring is stretched when the length of the spring is greater than its natural length during this course of motion during this course of motion the force constant of the spring is k1 that means this block is experiencing a force towards left that is equal to k1 into x where x is its displacement from the mean position similarly once the block returns to the equilibrium position and starts moving to the left side the spring gets compressed and when the spring is compressed uh, the question says the force constant becomes 0 0.016 when l is less than f1 when the spring gets compressed when the block starts moving to left from its equilibrium position the force constant of the spring has increased by some way so when block begins to move from here to here it is experiencing a force which is k2x and then while returning back from this extreme to mean position still it is experiencing a force that is k2x so what can we say we can say that this half of the simple harmonic motion of the block this half of the simple harmonic motion of the block was happening under influence of a force which was having a force constant k1 and the other half of the motion uh, this half of the simple harmonic motion was happening under influence of a force which was having a force constant k so what is the total time period very simple during this part of the journey the time that the block will consume is half of the time period the standard formula of time period is this half of this t by 4 for this part t by 4 for this part and we have to be careful that the value of k that we should be taking is k1 so we will write time period is 2 pi under root l whatever uh, under root m sorry m is 0.1 kg and k1 is 0 0.009 0 0.009 and then for remaining half for this part of the journey we will again apply the same formula i am so sorry it is not 2 pi it is pi right half of this half of this and again pi 0.1 by uh, k2 which is 0 0.016 so the total time period is nothing but t1 plus t2 you just add these two numbers you just add these two numbers and you will get answer to this question solve this uh, uh, you will get something like um, very close to six five point nine into pi something like that so the closest integer uh, integral value of n um, i mean if you get n is equal to five point nine the closest integer is six so our answer will be 6 you just simplify this and i remember that uh, the answer will be 6 i am not doing this for you i guess all of you can do this uh, let me have a sip of coffee before i can move on to the next question students what i am trying to tell you is uh, not the solution of these question what i am trying to tell you is how you could have tracked this exam, uh, seemingly very difficult exam, by solving these questions. See how many easy questions have been. Forget about the tough one chat. Huh? Let us have a look at the next question. Well, uh, this question is a bit uh, long to read, I would say. But it is something that again, I think, uh, every physics teacher teaches in his or her class. And every average student uh, does solve this kind of question. Read the question. Read the question. 
okay read it with me an object and a concave mirror are there concave mirror has a focal length of 10 cm and both move along the principal axis of the mirror this is the principal axis the object as well as mirror both can move along the principal axis of the uh, mirror with constant speed constant speed there is no acceleration the object moves with speed 15 cm per second towards the mirror 15 cm per second towards the mirror okay with respect to the laboratory frame matlab with respect to ground frame with respect to someone who is standing on ground uh the speed of the object is 15 cm per second towards right in this particular diagram the distance between the object and the mirror at a given moment is denoted by u which is usual i mean everybody denotes it by u isn't it so uh, if even if this statement was not there you would have understood okay what u is anyway when u is 30 cm at the instant when this u is 30 cm the speed of the mirror vm vm is the speed of the mirror the speed of the mirror is such that the image is instantaneously at rest in the laboratory frame for a man standing on ground at this particular instant when the object is at a distance of 30 cm from the mirror the image is stand still image is not moving the velocity of image at that particular instant is zero this is what the question says then you have to tell what is the magnitude of vm at what velocity the mirror is actually moving if uh, the image velocity is found to be zero when object is at a distance of 30 cm from the mirror so students first by using the mirror formula we can find out the position of the image when object is at a distance of 30 cm so the mirror formula is 1 by b Plus one by u is equal to one by f. So, v is not known to us. We can calculate it. Value of u will be minus thirty, and because it is a concave mirror, value of f will be minus ten. So, if you simplify this, you get one by thirty, one by ten. V is equal to, I guess, thirty by two by fifteen with a negative sign. V is 15 centimeter with a negative sign. Am I right? Yes, I guess I am right. Ah, uh, now by differentiating this mirror formula, we get a relationship between dv by dt and du by dt. I guess any sincere student has done. and many of you might be remembering the final formula i am assuming that you know it it is a very common thing so we know that velocity of image with respect to mirror which is nothing but dv by dt rate of change of v what is v image is here this is image v is the distance of the image from the mirror and dv by dt dv by dt is rate of change of distance of image from the mirror So dv by dt is nothing but velocity of image with respect to mirror. Mirror being the reference point. So velocity of image with respect to mirror, I think many of you know that it is minus of the square of linear magnification into velocity of object relative to mirror. This is a standard formula that all of you must be knowing. So using this, we can answer this question. uh in our particular uh, example this particular question velocity of image with respect to mirror mirror is velocity of image minus velocity of mirror this is relative motion and magnification as we all can see is magnitude of it is 1 by 2 because magnification is v upon u v is 15 u is 30 so the ratio is uh, half so this is half squared and this means velocity of object minus velocity of mirror students when i write vim as vi minus vm this vi is velocity of image in lab frame in laboratory frame in ground frame this is velocity of mirror in ground frame this is velocity of object in ground frame this is velocity of mirror in ground frame isn't it so in the question it is said that vi is zero this is zero 
the image does not appear to be moving in the ground frame. So, what is the value of Vm? That is what we have to find. Vo is given. Velocity of object is given. So, now you can easily work out Vo because everything else is known. Uh, minus of Vm is equal to minus of 1 by 4 and this is V0 and this is plus of 1 by 4 Vm. So, shift this to this side and it becomes minus of rather I will leave the minus sign because if you move it on this side everything becomes negative only leave it. So, this becomes pi by 4 of Vm is 1 by 4 of V0. So, Vm is nothing but uh, Vm is nothing but Vo by pi we are just working out the magnitude that is what has been required. So, Vm is nothing but V0 by pi. So, it is 15 by 5 3 centimeter per second. And in fact, uh, 3 centimeter per second, 3 centimeter per second. In fact, those of you who have really solved this kind of question, uh, you must be knowing that when I say that uh, Vm and Vo, Vo velocity of object, Vm velocity of mirror. When I say both are having same sign, that means they are moving in same direction. So, if the object is moving towards uh, right in this particular diagram, the mirror must also be moving towards right and the velocity of mirror is uh, 3 centimeter per second. So, this is how easy this particular question is and uh, I think all uh, those who appeared in the exam this year must have been able to solve it. I am very sure, pretty confident. And others who are going to appear in next year or maybe next to next year, uh, all of you who are watching this video must acknowledge this fact. Okay, JE advance is a tough exam, but it is not so tough. All questions are not exactly so tough that actually nobody can do it. No. There are many questions which a well prepared student will definitely manage to solve inside the exam. And remember, again, it is a very low score. Yeah. Isn't it? So, uh, it is not that difficult actually to get selected in one of the IITs. Today, we will solve few more easy questions. What I am trying to tell you all is just by picking up the easiest question among the all given questions, we can ensure a very good marks in IIT JE advanced, JE uh, advanced exam and that can fetch you a seat in one of the IIT. So, in the last session, in the last session, we skipped this question saying that it is tough. Uh, it may not be very tough when you are outside the exam hall, but inside the exam hall when you have been allotted a limited amount of time, this question can be really tough to solve. So, I suggested that if I am a student uh, inside the exam hall, I will just skip this question in first round. The second question is one, one of the easiest questions in the entire paper and I will definitely go and solve this. Then the third one I said that okay, I am not very sure whether it is tough or easy. It depends, but ultimately I said okay, let us assume that it is a tough question, leave it, leave it for a moment. This one again a very easy question. In the very beginning of your class 11, you have studied dimensional analysis and you all know how to solve this question. It is a bit lengthy, but on easier side, the concept is easy and any well prepared student will be able to solve it. It may take some 5-6 minutes. But yes, you can definitely do this and just after reading the question, you get a sense that yes, you will be able to do it. So, under such circumstances, one must attempt the question and finish it. Yes, 
this gives you uh, some very good marks. Then we had this question and I said that okay, I'll skip it because it is on tougher side. Uh, this one again it is one of the easiest questions, we solved it, in fact you do not need to do any calculation also, uh, just by observation you can answer this question, so easy mark, is not it. This one I said that this is also on easier side only and any well prepared student will be able to do it, we solved this question in the last uh, This one also I said that any well prepared student. Uh, does solve such kind of questions during his or her preparation, we solved it in, it in the last two years. Now let us move on, this is a question uh, which says that inside this spherical region of radius r a, uh, there is a, a spherically symmetric charge, but it varies radially, the charge density varies radially. The charge density varies with radius r according to this equation. Rho is proportional to r basically, k is sub r. And thereafter, between radius r a and r b, that means in this region, in this region, the charge density again varies and it varies according to some different relation. The charge density is uh, 2k by r. Okay. Now, what does the question actually ask? Read these options, just read them. If Rb is so much, value of Ra is given, the inner ball has a radius of 1 unit, the outer ball if it has a radius of under root 3 by 2 unit, then the electric field is 0 everywhere outside. That means here at all points, the electric field is 0, this is the claim of the first option, we have to uh, identify whether it is a right statement or wrong statement. Similarly, if Rb is 3 by 2, then what is the electric potential here just outside the, the sphere? Similarly, if Rb is 2, then what is the total charge inside this uh, spherical zone? If Rb is 5 by 2, then what is the magnitude of electric field just outside the, the sphere B at this point? That means we have to find potential here, we have to find electric field here, we have to calculate the total charge inside this spherical region. This is the question. So, uh, a well prepared student knows actually that uh, total charge can be calculated by way of integration. And once you have found the total charge in this spherical region, it is very easy to write potential at this point or heat at this point because the whole charge can be assumed to be a point charge located at the center of the sphere, is not it? For outside points, for outside points, the whole charge can be assumed to be located at the center of the sphere. Now, of course, this question does not look to be very tough, but still I would consider it to be on tougher side. Yes, you have heard it correctly. I will consider it to be on tougher side because it involves at least two integrations. So, just because it the solution is a bit lengthy, I will say okay, let us let me assume that it is on tougher side in first round, let us skip this question. Do not get worried, I will give you a solution of all these questions in the next video. But uh, what I am trying to teach you is which are the questions that we should be attempting inside the exam hall in our first round of attempt, right. So, okay, let me assume that this is a tough question and skip it. Many of you who are really well prepared, uh, they can even uh, decide to solve this question in their first round. Order. But for the time being, I am skipping this question. I move on to next question. Next question. And this is one question which I can say is really, really easy. Really easy. I mean, uh, many of 10th passes to them. Uh, may be able to solve this. Yes, uh, you studied about electric circuit in your class 10th also and the concepts that you learnt there, it is good enough to solve this question. Yes, you have heard it correctly. Though the question appears to be quite lengthy, but the, when you go on reading the question, uh, it may be a full page question, the options are here. So, it is quite lengthy to read the question. 
but once you have understood it is very easy the concept involved the concepts those are involved uh, you have learnt all those concepts in your class so this is one question that i would say yes it is very easy and a student should solve it in the very first round of attempting the question inside the exam let us solve it. let us let us see what the question is exactly there are two circuits right one and two circuit 1 and circuit 2 shown in figure have resistances r1 1 ohm r2 2 ohm and r3 is 3 ohm very easy to remember r1 is 1 r2 is 2 and r3 is 3 here also r1 is 1 r2 is 2 and r3 is 3 ohm uh, p1 and p2 are power dissipated in circuit 1 and 2 when switches s1 and s2 are open in the original figure we can see that this switch is open this switch is also open s1 and s2 are open and when they are open the power that is being consumed in this circuit is being denoted by p1 and power that is being consumed in this circuit is being denoted by p2 now the question says q1 and q2 are power dissipation in circuit 1 and 2 when switch s when switch s1 and s2 are closed when these two switches are closed then power dissipated in this circuit is being denoted by q1 and power dissipated in this circuit is being denoted by symbol q so p1 and p2 q1 and q2 they are just symbol isn't it p1 is power dissipated in this circuit when switch s1 is open p2 is power dissipated in this circuit when switch s2 is open and similarly q1 and q2 are power dissipated in the two circuit when switches are closed now before attempting any kind of solution uh, i would suggest that you should read all the four options read the four options and think it like a subjective question what exactly has been asked try to calculate that and then again read the options and see which are correct for example if you read all these options first option says when a voltage source of 6 volt is connected across a and b then p2 is greater than p1 when you when you connect a voltage source that means you connect a battery over here it is having a voltage of 6 volt and you also connect a battery of 6 volt potential difference over here then uh, there will be some power dissipated in the circuit that is p1 there will be some power dissipated in the circuit that is p2 now you have to compare whether p2 is larger or p1 is larger then again when a constant current source of 2 milli ampere is connected then which one is higher p1 or p2 if we replace this battery by some kind of source which delivers a constant current of 2 milli ampere think of a source which delivers constant current of 2 milli ampere irrespective of how much resistance has been connected to it. whatever be the value of the equivalent resistance this source delivers 2 milli ampere of constant current similarly here also if you attach a constant current source it delivers 2 milli ampere current so the question says when a constant current source of 2 milli ampere is connected across a and b then which one is larger p1 or p2 right then read again the uh, other two statement when a voltage source of 6 volt is connected across a and b q1 is greater than p1 so when you have 6 volt battery connected q1 and p1 you have to compare q1 and p1 what is p1 p1 is power consumed here when switch is open what is q1 q1 is power consumed in the circuit when switch is closed given this again the last option says when a constant current source is added then compare q1 and q2 what is q1 and q2 uh, which which is closed the amount of power dissipated is q1 and q2 so which one is larger when this constant current source has been added so in nut cell what the question is asking is uh, if you connect same emf cell in the two cell uh, in the two circuit and switches remain open then how much power is consumed here how much power is consumed here which one is larger actually similarly when switches are closed then again we have to make a kind of comparison 
uh, which circuit consumes more power, isn't it? So it's why I'm saying that it is very easy. Uh, many of you must have guessed the answer also. <laughs> yes. Let us first assume that switches are open as uh, it has been shown in the circuit. When switches are open, what is the equivalent resistance of what is the equivalent resistance of this circuit? Figure it out. There is one ohm, there is two ohm, there is three ohm, and there is R1 by 2. R1 by 2 means 1 by 2. So what is the equivalent resistance? 2 and 3 in series makes 5. Right? 5 and half in parallel. 5 and half in parallel makes uh, 5 into half by 5 plus half. When two resistances R1 and R2 are in parallel, their equivalent resistance is R1, R2 by R1 plus R2. So, 2 and 3 is 5 in series, 5 and half are in parallel. So, equivalent of this group of registers will be 5 divided by 11. Right. Now, this switch is open. So, the equivalent of this group of registers is connected in series to R1. What is R1? It is 1. So, the equivalent of the entire group of resistances, this is in series with R1. So, it becomes 16 by 11. Isn't it? Similarly, let us work out the equivalent resistance in this circuit when this switch is open. When this switch is open, this has got no meaning at all. It is not there in this circuit. And we have got three resistances R1, R2, and R3 in parallel. So, what will be the equivalent resistance? 1 by R1, 1 by R2, 1 by R3. Isn't it? So, this becomes 6, 6, uh, just a minute. This is 6 plus 3 plus, so R is 6 by 11. When this, both these switches are open, this is 16 by 11 and this is 6 by 11. Right? I think it is absolutely right. Okay. Uh, now, when you connect a battery of EMFP, 6 volt is not very important here. Actually. If we connect a battery of EMFP volt here, what is the power dissipated in this circuit? That is, what is the value of P1? So, one can easily understand that P1 will be V square by R, R equivalent, V square by R. So, in this case, the power dissipated in this circuit will be V square by R. Okay. The equivalent resistance in this circuit, let me write let me write it as R01 and equivalent resistance here, let me write it as R02. So, power dissipated in this circuit will be V square by R. Now, you have studied that power dissipated in a resistance can be written as V square by R or I square R. In this particular question, when both these circuits have been uh, connected to same voltage source. We should not be using I square R, isn't it? We should be using V square by R. It makes the comparison easier because voltage of both these sources is same V. So, to compare V1, uh, P1 and P2, we just need to see, we just need to see the value of R01 and R02. In this particular question, this resistance is higher than this. Equivalent resistance of this is higher than equivalent resistance of this. So, if resistance is high, power V square by R, V square by R, V is same. If R is high, power will be low, power will be low. Then the circuit which has got higher resistance will dissipate less power. So, this is the circuit which has got, which has got higher resistance. So, if the resistance is higher, then the power dissipated here will be on lower side. So, when the switches are open and 6 volt battery has been connected, 
resistance of this circuit is higher therefore power dissipated will be on lower side which means p2 is greater than p1 p2 is greater than p1 so the first option says p2 is greater than p when 6 volt source is connected yes this is right isn't it now what happens what happens if you connect if you connect Achha, uh, just just one. There is one question which says, uh, uh, the second one says that a constant current source has been connected. Okay. When we connect a constant current source, it is not a constant voltage source now. It is a constant current source. Whatever be the value of equivalent resistance, the source is just providing a fixed current of 2 milliamps. Whatever be the value of current, uh, doesn't matter actually. The power dissipated here will be, that means, uh, P1 will be I square R01, I is the current, R01 is the equivalent resistance of this circuit. Similarly, what is the value of power consumed in this particular circuit? The answer is P2 is I square R01. Now, when the constant current source has been added to the circuit, we should not be using formula V square by, we should be using I square by, I square into one. It makes the comparison. I is same in both the cases. Power is going to be high when the resistance is high. So, where is the resistance high in this circuit? It, it is 16 by 11, here it is only 6 by 11. So, resistance is high means power consumed in this circuit will be higher. Now, what does the statement say? When a constant current source is added, P1 is greater than P2. So, this appears to be a correct statement. Then, now, look at the third option. Again, 6 volt source is added uh, and we have to make comparison of Q1 and P1 actually. So, what exactly is Q1? When this switch is closed, can you see that this resistance is short circuited? That means actually, actually the uh, circuit will be like this. This resistance has no role to play. This is short circuit. So the whole circuit is like this. There will be no current through here uh, through this resistance. Whatever current is there, it will be going like this. So there is no role of this resistance. So, when the switch is closed, when the switch is closed, then the equivalent resistance will have a different value, does not it? When the switch is closed, the equivalent resistance will have a different value. What will be its value? When these two are still in series and this is in parallel with that, uh, here we have written that. These two are in series makes 5, 5 and this half in parallel makes 5 by 11. So, when this switch is closed, shorted, this resistance has no role to play and the equivalent resistance is 5 by 11, 5 by 11. When switch is open, when switch is open, the resistance is 16 by 11. When the switch is closed, the resistance is 5 by 11. So, when the switch is open, the resistance is higher. Now, what is the question exactly? 6 volt source has been connected in this, back, uh, in this circuit. So, the power will be V square by R. We will use the formula V square by R, which makes the comparison really easy. So, lower the resistance, higher will be the power. Now, which case resistance is lower? When the switch is open, it is 16 by 11. When the switch is closed, it is lower, lower, 5 by 10. So, when switch is closed, the resistance is low and the power will be high. Switch closed, power high. When the switch is closed, power is being denoted by Q1. It is high. It is higher than P1. So, Q1 is higher than P1. Am I right? So, this option is correct. Then the last one. When a constant current source is connected to both the circuit, compare Q2 and Q1. Again, uh, we have already 
worked out that in this particular circuit, uh, in this particular circuit, the equivalent resistance is pi pi 11 when switch is closed. So let me draw a diagram here. Pi pi 11 ohm is connected to a source which delivers a constant current of 2 milliampere. Right? When the switch is closed. Now, when the switch is closed, what is the equivalent resistance here? These three resistances have an equivalent of 6 pi less. You are attaching one more resistance in parallel. If you close this switch, you are attaching one more resistance in parallel and value of this resistance is 2 R3 means 6 ohm. So, actually, this is 6 ohm and equivalent of these three is 6 by 11. 6 by 11. And you are connecting this to our constant current source. This source provides a constant current of 2 milliampere. So, what is the equivalent resistance here? Again, it is 6 into 6 by 11 divided by 6 plus 6 by 11. So, this makes it 36 divided by 72 if I am right. 11 6 is 66 plus 6 72. So, this is half of so, when the switch is closed, the resistance here is half ohm, 0.5. What is it here? It is less than half. It is 0.4 something. It is not 0.5. So, resistance is less here. The resistance is high. And for comparing the power, we should be using this formula because the current is fixed in both the circuits. So, resistance is higher here. Means power consumption is higher in this case. So, Q2 is greater than Q1, not the other way around. The question says Q1 is greater. So, this is not correct. This is not correct. So, students, I assume that I have been able to tell you that this question was really isn't it? It may require 4 or 5 minutes of your time, but it is definitely on ETF side. And this is one question that every aspiring student who is aspiring for IIT seat uh, must have solved it. The only reason why he or she did not solve it inside the exam hall is the only reason why a student was not able to solve such kind of question inside the exam hall is because the student was involved in solving this kind of question. He or she was thinking that, yes, I can do this question. They spent a uh, lot of time on this kind of questions and, and in the end, they were not very sure about their answer. So, they found that, okay, one hour is over and they are left with no time and they have solved very few questions. So, it is very important to be able to identify the easier ones. Uh, so that you can solve them and basically you know that your answers are right. There is no uh, chance of negative marking even if it is there. So, in subjective questions I guess there was no negative marking. Okay. Now, this is a question uh, as you can see. Uh, the question says that there is a bubble uh, having, uh, if the bubble is made of some liquid which is having a surface tension air and there is an ideal gas inside the bubble uh, which has the ratio of specific is Cg by Cg equal to gamma which is given as pi by 3. The bubble is exposed to atmosphere and assume that it always remains spherical. Now, when the atmospheric pressure is P1, Pa1, it is given Pa1, A for atmosphere, 1 for initial value. The radius of the bubble is R1 and the temperature of the gas inside it is P1 when the atmospheric pressure becomes P A2. Now, the atmospheric pressure changes for some reason uh, and the temperature and radius both of them change. They become R2 and T2. Then, uh, these are the things to be answered. Now, though this question is again 
not very tough as I will tell you in the next few But uh, looking at the construct of this posture, it involves concepts of surface tension, uh, thermodynamics. So, again let me mark it as a difficult posture and I will not touch it in my first round of attempt inside the exam. So, let me skip this one. Surface tension thermodynamics appears to be complicated, though it is not. I tell you, it is not. But in first round of my uh, attempt, I will just skip this one. I will move on to next one. Now, this is a question uh, I could recall that uh, a similar question question on similar setup, similar system has already appeared in IIT J question paper of 19, if I could recall it correctly. Uh, in old IIT J question paper, you will find this case, that there is a charge disk and on its vertical axis there is a particle having mass m and charge q which is released from some height. Uh, whether it will reach the disk or not something of that sort, a question was there in very old uh, IIT J question. It is the same thing. When you release this mass, it experiences two force, the electrostatic repulsion of this charge and one is gravitational. Now, in this particular question, the quotient does not take gravitational force, it has written it in different format, slightly different format. The quotient says that there is a force of minus C k cap, this is that direction if you read the question. So, minus C k cap where C is positive number. That means, there is a constant force acting on the particle in negative z direction. So, actually uh, in the old question paper what was mg, in this question it is C, C is nothing but mg. In the old question paper it was mg. In this question paper, it is C. That is the only difference. And then you have been asked uh, whether under cer certain situation particle will be able to reach this point or not, uh, whether it will be able to cross through this disk or not, blah blah. Uh, so, again, the students who have already solved past year JE question paper, they will find it to be easy. But those who have somehow missed this question, they have not solved this question during their profession, they will find it to be tough. So, again I will mark it as a tough question, leave it, leave it. Some of you must be wondering, uh, what am I doing, I am leaving all the questions, no. How many questions have you solved till now? If I am not wrong, uh, it is about 7 questions we have solved uh, and there are total 18 questions in the paper. And those seven were very easy questions. So, my aim is not to give you solution as uh, there will be a countless number of videos on YouTube which will give you solution of these questions. Uh, I want to tell you how you could have picked up easier ones and cracked the yet. Of course, I will give you the solution for tougher ones also in a very lucid manner, but wait for that, we will do it in the next. Now, this particular question, it is based on uh, interference of light, Young's double slit experiment. The question basically says that, this is medium 1, some other medium having refractive index n 1 and the blue colored one is some other medium having refractive index n 2. Uh, these are two slits at a separation t. The first slit is just inside medium n1 and the second slit is somewhere in medium having refractive index n2. A parallel beam of light is incident, a parallel beam of light is incident on this slit plane like this. Uh, after refraction, after refraction, here refraction will occur. So, after refraction light travels in this direction, theta is the angle of refraction. So, 
So there is a detector at a very large distance from this slit plane and it receives light coming from this slit as well as this slit. So there is an interference of these two light beams at a far away distance from the plane of the slit and then there are uh, portions that have been arced. Uh, what will be phase difference between the two waves reaching this detector? Will it depend on D or not? Uh, whether the interference will be constructive or not, those kind of questions are there. Again, I will tell you, this is a very easy question, but, but only for those students who are not scared of uh, a new system, entirely new system. I am not sure whether many of you would have solved this kind of question, exactly this kind of question during your preparation, may not have. So, though it is an easy question, but I would keep it as a tough one because many of you may not have seen such question during your preparation stage. And the second reason for marking is that a bit tough is the question is very long to read. There are so many sentences, then there is diagram to comprehend, and then there are options. You can see I cannot put it in one screen, one slide. Such is the length of the question. So, because of that reason, I am keeping it in. Uh, medium to tough cutting okay so i'll leave okay uh, well again this is a very easy question actually you have to write angular momentum of a moving body uh, this this is fixed and this this is rolling you just need to write angular momentum that is what the question asks you to do but because it is a rotational motion question and again it is a system uh, which is something new that means this is a fixed thing and this is rolling over it. So, I will say okay, it is moderately difficult, let us leave it, why worry about it, just leave it here in the first round. Though many of you will really find it good, I will solve this question in the next, but for the time being, I am categorizing it as difficult because it is a somewhat new system. Okay. And it is from one of the most dreaded topics, uh, rotational. Leave it, leave it, leave it, don't worry. Now, many of the students who are watching this video must be presently in class. So, you might not have studied modern physics till now, or you uh, might have studied about photoelectric effect in your chemistry class. But you may not have studied it in physics class. So, in case you have not studied it in physics class, or you are not able to recall what you studied in your chemistry class, in that case, you must watch this video again uh, after you study this talk. In fact, uh, I do not think you will require to watch this. Uh, it is a damn. Those of you who are aware of photoelectric effect, whether you have studied it in chemistry or physics, does not matter. All of you will realize, you must recognize, this is one of the easiest questions to see. It is one of the uh, Let us read the question. We will do it. We have to do it. This is the kind of question we are looking for in the first round of attack. When a light of given wavelength is incident on a metal surface, the minimum potential needed to stop the emitted photoelectron is. Uh, this is a metal surface, some light is incident on it, it has got some wavelength lambda and uh, the stopping potential difference is fixed. So, from Einstein's photoelectric equation, we all know that. When light of wavelength lambda is incident on a surface, uh, energy of each photon is Hc by lambda. And energy of each photon is actually equal to work function plus maximum kinetic energy of emitted electron. And maximum kinetic energy of emitted electron is measured through stopping potential. If the stopping potential difference is denoted by V s, then maximum kinetic energy of emitted electron can be written as E to V s. 
right uh so the question this is the equation that we have to use the question says that this potential difference is 6 volt when a light of certain wavelength is incident on a metallic surface and this the stopping potential difference drops to 0.6 volt if another source with wavelength four times that of the first one and intensity half of the first one now intensity this word has been deliberately put here to confuse there is no role of intensity uh, the stopping potential difference or the kinetic energy of emitted electron depends only on the wavelength of the incident it has got nothing to do with intensity right so let us assume initially the wavelength is lambda so stopping potential difference is 6 volt so i can write it like this is e into 6 e is the charge on the electron and then when wavelength is made four times this lambda becomes four lambda work function metal same metal is same so work function remains same now this is stopping potential difference becomes 0 0.6 so the same equation is appearing like this now some data is given that you have to take hc by e is equal to so much and all that uh, the question asks what is the wavelength of the first source and the work function of it that means you have to find lambda and phi look at the question these are two equations a very standard formula everybody knows hc by lambda is phi plus e now two set of data has been given when wavelength used is lambda work uh, stopping potential difference is 6 when wavelength used is 4 lambda the stopping potential difference is 0.6 is it? so you have got two equations and there are two answers lambda and phi we have to figure out uh, the values of lambda and phi now it is very easy in fact uh, H C by lambda is phi plus six. Let me write phi plus six C here in place of H C by lambda. So phi plus six C in place of H C by lambda divided by this four is actually phi plus point six. So this makes it phi plus six C is equal to four phi plus two point four. Isn't it? Just simplifying this gives me uh, 3 phi, 3 phi is equal to this 0.6, 4 phi minus phi is 3 phi, 6 e minus 2.4 this gives us, this gives us 3.4. So phi is 1.2. Phi is 1.2 e. What does it mean? Phi is some sort of energy. This energy, this energy, this energy. Phi is 1.2 e. What is the value of phi? It is. It is. 1.2 electron volt. If you wish to write this in joule, then you will say it is 1.2 into electronic charge 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule. But the commonly used unit is electron volt. So this is 1.2 into E, 1.2 into 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule. But if you write the energy in electron volt, it is simply 1.2 electron volt is it or uh, if from the beginning itself you write all the energy values in electron volt what will happen uh, let us say we have written this in electron volt this is also in electron volt this is also in electron volt if you decide that way then you need not write this e it is 6 electron volt again you need not write this e it is 0.6 electron volt 
so now we are confident we are sure inside our mind that this is energy value in electron volt this is energy value in electron volt and this is energy value in electron volt so in that case you will not get that e and uh, phi will be 1.2 electron volt okay fine so you have got uh, electron volt and the value of phi in electron volt. now 1.2 and 1.2 are placed at two locations very intelligent people are making this process. actually uh, if it were 1.7 here i would have ticked this one as the right option i would not have calculated the work on but here uh, since there are two options which are having uh, same value of work function so i would have to calculate the wave not the work function i would have to calculate the wave how will i do that i'll substitute this value of phi in any one of these two equations and simplify for lambda uh, here it is given that hc by e is this much so what i can do i can divide this whole equation by e and we can keep everything in joule let this e be there divide by e so this is hc by e lambda this is phi by e and this is 6 you know the value of phi that is 1.2 e place it there you know the value of hc by e it is given here so you will be able to calculate lambda isn't it so i leave i leave this for you and let me see if i have got the answer uh, the value of lambda is 1.72 into 10 to the power minus 7. so option a is the correct answer you just need to substitute this value of phi and simplify for lambda in any of these two equations so you just need to know one formula there are two conditions given you just write that formula for two conditions there are two unknowns it is a linear equation in two variable x and y simplify that is the whole question what can be easier than what do you expect <laughs> nothing it's so easy it's so easy okay uh, now this is a question from experimental physics any one of you who studied about vernier calipers and its two bars you must realize that this is a very routine and simple question so any well prepared student will definitely attempt it in the very first round let us do it let us see the question says area of cross section of a wire is being measured using a screw bar the pitch of the main scale is 0.5 millimeter the circular scale has 100 division and for one full rotation of the circular scale the main scale shifts by 2 degrees now uh, i have a bit of objection uh, in this question i don't consider it to be a well written question the question says the pitch of the main scale. What is pitch of? Uh, we normally use this term pitch for something like screw, helix. What is pitch actually? When a screw is given one full rotation, the amount of distance that it travels is pitch. That is how we really recognize pitch. But anyway, the question says that on the main scale of these screw bar, on the main scale of these screw bar, these markings are at uh, a difference of 0.5 the distance between two main scale marks is 0.5 this is what they are calling pitch it is not the pitch in our usual sense pitch means when you give a full rotation to the screw the distance by which it advances is pitch but the markings on main scale are at separation of 0.5 mm this would have been more correct way of writing this statement this is the only thing that i want to say now the circular scale has 100 division and for one full rotation of the circular scale the main scale shifts by 2 degrees question says when you rotate the here it is a circular scale as you all must be aware here there is a circular scale when you rotate it there are 100 divisions on this circular scale when it is given one full rotation this collar this color shifts on the main scale by 2 degrees 2 degrees 
means one millimeter. It travels one millimeter. So actually, when the screw is being given one full rotation, it is traveling by a distance of one millimeter. That is what the question says. One full rotation. Uh, this collar shifts on the main scale by two degrees. Again, here the question says, uh, in one full rotation, the main scale shifts by two degrees. Uh, I have objection to this statement. The main scale does not move. Main scale is fixed actually. Where is it moving? This collar is moving actually. It is traveling on the main scale. But anyway, uh, when you gave two full rotation, the collar moves, a collar of the circular scale moves, two division on the main scale. So, the pitch of the screw, the pitch of the screw, the pitch that we know, pitch of the screw is actually one millimeter. In one full rotation, it travels by one millimeter. Am I right? Am I right? So it travels by one millimeter. So pitch is one millimeter. I guess I am able to convince you that pitch is one. Millimeter. Pitch is one. So we all know that the least count of this screw was the pitch divided by number of divisions on the circular scale. So, there are 100 divisions. So, pitch is 1 millimeter, 500.01 mm. 0 0.01 mm is the least distance that our screw bar can actually measure. This is the pitch. Now, there is some data given. Uh, the uh, diameter of the wire is being measured. That is the question. Uh, area of cross section of the wire is being measured. Okay. For that, we will measure the diameter. And this is the data given. The question says when two arms are touching each other without a wire, no object has been placed uh, between the anvil and the uh, screw actually. And there is no gap uh, between the two jaws. In that case, ideally, uh, what should happen? The screw gauge should give us zero reading. Main scale reading should be zero as well as the circular scale reading should be zero. But it is not the case here. The main scale reading is zero, but circular scale reading is four. This is known as this is known as zero error. I am sure you all know that. This is known as zero error. So when it should be showing zero, it is showing some reading. How much reading is that? Four division circular scale. Four division of circular scale means 4 into 0.01. Each division of circular scale means 0 0.01 mm. So 4 into point, least count 0 0.01. So this is equal to 0 0.04 mm. This is the excess reading that our screw was in fact. And from the final reading, this should be subtracted. This should be subtracted. We have to keep this in memory. Now, first attempt, we take our first reading. First reading, main scale reading is 4 division, okay, which means 4 division on main scale is only 2 millimeter because each division is 0.5 mm. So, this is 2 millimeter plus the circular scale reading. The circular scale reading is 20 division into least count 0 0.01. So, this becomes uh, 0.2. Am I right? So, the first reading, first reading is 2 millimeter plus 0.2 millimeter, 2.2 millimeter, 2.2 millimeter. But again, recall that this is screw gauge is faulty. It is having some zero error, and it shows excess reading of uh, 0.04 millimeter. That needs to be subtracted from. So this becomes 2.20 minus point. Actually, it is 2.20 minus 0 0.04. So it becomes 2. Point one six error. This is our first reading. After taking one reading, we will say that uh, diameter is two point one six error. Move on to the second reading. Four divisions again two millimeter on main scale. Sixteen division multiplied by least count is point one six. So it is two plus point one six, two point one six. Subtract the zero error, and it becomes two point. 1, 2, error. So, actually, the experimenter, the person who is uh, taking the measurement, 
he has measured the diameter of the wire twice and his first reading is 2.16 mm and his second reading is 2.12 mm. So, uh, what will be my best estimate? Suppose I have taken only two readings. Now, what should I report? What should I say about the diameter of the wire? Obviously, we will take the average of it. These are two readings, x1 and x2, and the best value that I can tell you about the diameter of the wire is nothing but average of the mean of these. So, this becomes 2.14 m. So, if you ask me, Sasi Bhushan, uh, you have taken these two readings, what is the diameter of the wire according to you? I will say, as per my best judgment, it is 2.14 Then, if you put a gun on my head and ask, are you very confident that this is 2.14 m? I would say, no, Baba. This is my best judgment, but there could be some error. Now, how large that error can? How much is the error uh, that is again uh, based on the judgment of the experiment? He is the best person to tell you uh, what would be maximum error in this one. So, one way of estimating, um, this is not a very correct way I would say, but this is what has been prescribed in your syllabus and this is how you have been estimating the error. So, let us do it that way only. Uh, one of the ways of estimating the magnitude of the error is to find mean of all the absolute which you call as mean absolute Now, this reading is 2.16, the reading is 2.12, you have calculated the average, this is 2.14. One thing is sure that God is not going to give you a phone call and tell you the diameter of the wire. So, in absence of that phone call, <laughs> the best value according to you is this. This is the true value. This is the true value. This is the true value. But I am afraid there could be some error. But this is the true value. So, in my first reading, in my first reading, uh, 2.16 mm, uh, what is the error that was there? Uh, my first reading was deviating from true value by 0 0.02. So, the error in first reading is 0 0.02. What is error in second reading? Again, the second reading deviates from true value, true value by 0 0.02. Ignore plus minus sign. Just we take the magnitude. So, these are errors in these two readings, individual reading. What is the error in individual reading? If I consider this as true value, then error in this individual reading is this minus this. If I consider this as uh, true value, now, if I consider this as true value, then reading this, this particular reading has an error of uh, size of 0 0.02, plus or minus does not matter. Now, what is, what is mean of, what is mean of these absolute errors? These are absolute errors, absolute error means error in a particular reading. Now, mean of all the errors, mean of these two, delta x mean, obviously this plus is by 2, uh, mean is 0 0.0. So, what I would say is, what I would say is, according to my best judgment, this is the diameter and according to my judgment only, this is the possible error in this. I have calculated error in each of the individual readings and taken mean of that. So, the error that I am telling you is also mean of many errors. So, finally, I will report my answer as 2.14 mm plus minus point. 0 to m. Students, are you there with me? I hope so. So, is there any answer like this? Yes, the diameter is 2.14 plus minus 0 0.02 m. Isn't it? So, in the list of diameters, I do not see any other option which is having 2.14 plus minus 0 0.02. So, in this case, in this case,
correct value of diameter and it is given only at one place so this is my correct answer uh, though i am your teacher and we are not here just to somehow find the answer so let me tell you how you should write the area in fact i need not tell you you all know that the diameter is known half of diameter is area uh, radius and pi r square is the area so if you wish to calculate the cross sectional area it is pi b square by 4 so you will calculate this area assuming the value of b to be this much remember because this is the true value accordingly but if you assume d to be this much you get a value of area which you are saying that okay this is the true value according to b but if i again put it, put a gun on your head you will say no there could be an error because uh, there could be an error in d so area will also have some error uh, when you calculate it this propagation of error so we all know how to calculate error in this case actually uh, you must have studied that fractional error in area is in this particular case given by 2 delta d by d so using this we can calculate delta a and then we can uh, give the value of area the area is this much plus minus of delta a. but that is not required in this question leave it <sighs> so this was a very easy question for those people who study about screw work see one thing is very clear the strategy that i am suggesting that one should be picking only easier questions and solving it inside the exam hall this will work only under one condition if you are thorough with this syllabus if you know every bit of your syllabus then obviously if an easy question appears from any topic you will be able to solve it so be thorough with your syllabus in that case certainly any easy question will really be an easy question for you otherwise if somebody has not studied his proof work and he must be wondering how come sir is saying that this is an easy question no it's not appearing easy to you because you do not know about proof work study about proof work and you will know why i am saying that this is a very easy question. and this question again is an easy Yes, it's an easy question. Uh, it's very easy. Question. Uh, it is a very easy question because it is a very routine kind of question, and uh, I will I will not be surprised if many of you already solved even this question or this kind of question during your preparation. The whole thing is uh, there is a straight wire starting from here. It carries a current I. It goes like this. when it bends into a semi circle it goes like this again bends into a semi circle and goes like so if the whole wire is carrying current i we have to write magnetic field at point two. very now due to this is straight part due to this is straight part the magnetic field here can be written using this form i hope all of you remember if this is a straight wire carrying current i at a perpendicular distance d from the wire there is a point p and these two angles are alpha and beta then you know that because of this current carrying wire the magnetic field here is given by mu not i by 4 pi d into sin alpha plus sin isn't it this is a very common formula that all of you do know so this is a wire of finite length whenever you have got a wire of finite length you we use this part So there is a wire of finite length, and if you study the diagram carefully, you will see that this is L by 2, this is L by 2, this length is L, this length is also L. So if I just, if I just, oh sorry, if I just join this, this angle will be 45 degrees. So this angle is 45, and this angle is zero because there is no wire here. The wire ends here. among alpha and beta one is uh, 45 and the other is 0 so that formula gives me magnetic field due to this straight wire at point o it will be mu not it will be mu not 
do not i by 4 pi d what is d this length what is that length l by 2 l by 2 do nothing but l into sin alpha plus sin beta sin alpha sin 45 1 by root 2 and sin beta sin 0 is and what is the direction of magnetic field at point O due to this point? If you have a wire like this bearing current in upward direction, the magnetic field lines are circle around it. Uh, how do we get the sense of circle? Keep your thumb in the direction of current and try to hold the wire, try to wrap your, the wire in your right hand. The curling fingers, these curling fingers give the sense of field line. So, in this case, this is the circle, this is the sense of the circle. So, at this point, the field is going inward. Inward. So, uh, at this particular point, P is inward. In this particular diagram, it is minus k cap. It is in negative z direction, isn't it? Uh, minus k cap. Okay. Done. Now, because of this semi-circle, what is P at this point? Everybody knows, I guess. Because of complete circle, it is 0 i by 0 i by 2 r. And if it is half of that, half of the circle. It will be mu naught i by 4 r. So, mu naught i by 4 r and the radius is l by 2, l by 2, mu naught i by 4 r. Mu naught i by 2 r is p due to complete circle. If, if it is half circle, it is mu naught i by 4 r. So, in place of r, I have written l by 2. What is the direction? Again, if a, there is a circular current carrying loop, p due to this current at every inside point is inward, inward, inward. So, again it is in negative z direction. So, minus k. Now, I guess all of you know that because of this wire there is no p. If there is a current carrying wire like this and you have a point in front of it or at the back end of it on the same line, there is no p. Similarly, because of this wire there is no p. Because of this there is a p, because of this there is a p, because of this this is quarter of a circle. Because of this, there is a field. Again, because of this, the field is in the same direction. And it is one fourth of a circle. So, mu naught i by 2 r is the formula. But one fourth of that. Mu naught i by 2 r, one fourth of that, mu naught i by 8 r. 8 r. What is r? r is l by 4. Minus k. Again, minus k. And this again, wire. Uh, this is a straight wire passing through, so it will not contribute any piece. So, some of these three, just this plus this plus this is our answer. This plus this plus this is our answer. You can yourself choose the correct answer from the options here. So, this, is the, this was the last question, 18th question was the last question in the physics paper of J Advanced 2020, second paper of so, let us count back how many easy questions were there and that we can have solved, that we could have solved uh, if we are thorough with our syllabus. Uh, this one, let us count back, this two, this three, this four, This is 5, this is 6, I did it in the last, this is 7, this is 8, this is 9 and this is 10. So, at least there were 10 very easy questions out of 80, which any well prepared student could have solved inside the exam or provided, he did not get emotionally attached to a particular question like this. If you get emotionally attached to a question like this and spend a uh, lot of time, then you are uh, at the end found wanting for time actually and you miss many inputs. So, that is not the correct strategy, that is what I wanted to demonstrate. And in fact, uh, 10 I have identified as easy questions, among remaining 8, there are many others which are at best moderately difficult. I will make one more video to cover all those questions. So, I think you all enjoyed uh, 
uh, these two videos. Thank you for being with me and have a very good day.